uh, Sunday or uh, Saturday rather. Yeah. Yeah. I had yesterday. Some time to yes. recover a bit. Yes. <laughs> Great to see you. <laughs> Great to see you. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay, let's start. So the first speaker today is Ken Intrilegator from UC San Diego and is going to talk about aspect of five dimensional, six dimensional superconformal field theories. Thank you. 
I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to come back here. I, I think this is my seventh time to Trieste, so it's always great to be here. And um, I'd also like to thank my collaborators, uh, Clay Cordova, Thomas Dimitrescu, Nadi Seiberg, Dave Morrison. Um, and I'll apologize in advance for admitting many references. So a lot of the talk will be, be kind of uh, following somewhat things that I've worked on myself. Okay, so for today's lecture plan, I'll start off with slides and then switch to the chalkboard. So I'll discuss some motivation and overview, uh, some tangential details. And in, in the first lecture today, I'll introduce some unitarity bounds and group theory for conformal field theories and super conformal field theories. One didn't get very far we're using just group theory. So I thought in the first lecture, I would discuss some of the group theory. And then in lecture two, two this afternoon, I'll introduce some of the string theory and brain constructions of 5D and 6D theories. Okay, for some motivation, we can ask what is quantum field theory? These are some uh, nearsighted physicists trying to study quantum field theory. And when we first meet quantum field theory, we study it uh, using perturbation theory around free field Lagrangians. And so this works very well for, for instance, for the standard model. Um, but in that way, you can only explore part of, of the space of quantum field theories. Uh, there are other theories that we can study. For instance, we could start with conformal field theories or super conformal field theories, which might not be close to any uh, perturbative description. And nevertheless, they can often be analyzed by using, for instance, bootstrap methods or other kinds of techniques. And then once we understand the conformal field theory, we can perturb the conformal field theory to explore more of the space of, of quantum field theories. So for example, uh, the topics of these lectures, 5D and 6D uh, super conformal field theories, uh, these theories aren't in any way perturbations uh, around free field Lagrangians. If you start off with free field theories in 5D and 6D dimensions, you just get uh, infrared free theories. Nevertheless, they're interacting 5D and 6D super conformal field theories. I, I put this F in capital letters, but not, uh, not for F theory necessarily, but because these are field theories, uh, despite being somewhat exotic. And sometimes they're referred to as non-Lagrangian because they're not close to any, uh, to any free field description. And it's, it's possible that some of these non-Lagrangian theories or maybe something else unexplored will be crucial for the future. Okay, so just to give some uh, kind of picture of renormalization group flows, the idea is that we can start off with some ultraviolet conformal field theory and then perturb it by some relevant operator and then flow down to some infrared conformal field theory. This reminds me a little bit of this game that I used to play before as a, as a kid called Chutes and Ladders where the irrelevant operators are like ladders that you can use to try to climb up and then the relevant operators are like shoots that take you down to lower energies. Uh, so for example, in the standard model, there are two relevant operators, the identity operator and uh, the Higgs mass. And so the fine tuning those operators are the two fine tuning problems. And then these irrelevant operators we can try to use to, to explore things beyond the, the standard model. And this is some picture of, of the renormalization group flows as, as kind of flowing down. Uh, it's flowing down in the number of degrees of freedom. So we start off with some ultraviolet conformal field theory, and then we add some relevant deformation, and then do some coarse graining and get some infrared conformal field theory, plus some irrelevant operators if we want to go a little bit away from the infrared fixed point. And these kinds of deformations could be, for instance, uh, various operators in the theory. And here I put delta L in, in quotes because this is okay even if the theory is not Lagrangian. So the idea is that if we can understand what are these operators, we can start off with a conformal field theory. We could look at, for instance, what's, what are all the relevant operators. Once we know what are the relevant operators, then we can turn those operators on and try to see where we go. And then we can explore more of the space of conformal field theory, more of the space of quantum field theories. So the conformal field theory is the starting point, and then we move away from there by these kinds of deformations. 
Uh, there are other deformations that will be useful to discuss. One is that's especially useful in supersymmetric theories is moving on the moduli space of supersymmetric vacua. Th this is one of the uh, aspects of supersymmetric quantum field theories that makes them so attractable is that they have this uh, space of vacua and you can move around on this space of vacua and sometimes connect it to some, to some limit that you understand better and then try to go back and, and gain, gain some insights. Another way to modify the theory is to gauge a, a global symmetry. Okay, so just to give a, um, just to give an example, in four dimensions we could start off with non-supersymmetric SUN gauge theory with F massless flavors, and then depending on F, there are various different possibilities. So if F is bigger than 11 halves times the number of colors, then the beta function is positive, near weak coupling at least, so the theory is not asymptotically free. Not asymptotically free in the ultraviolet means it's infrared free. So if we start off with this theory and we go to low energies, the, um, so we have beta G, something like that, and the theory wants to flow in the infrared to zero coupling. Uh, okay, and in the ultraviolet, we need, uh, we need either some kind of cutoff, or we could UV complete it to, in terms of some other theory, or in some cases, the theory is ultraviolet safe, like if this beta function eventually comes back down to zero, then there could be an ultraviolet fixed point. There are some examples of that. So that's if, if the number of flavors is bigger than 11 halves times the number of colors. If the number of flavors is less than that, but bigger than some uh, n star, let's call it, this is what's called the conformal window. In this range, what happens instead is that the, the beta function as a function of g looks like that. Um, And, and the beta function can have a zero. And so that's some conformal field theory in the infrared with some non-zero G star. Um, and the, the lower limit of this is, is some subject of interest that, that people have studied using various methods. And then um, if the number of flavors is less than that critical value, then there are ultraviolet, uh, so in the ultraviolet we still have free quarks and gluons, but in the infrared, instead there's confinement, chiral symmetry breaking, and infrared free uh, Goldstone boson pions. So this is kind of a, an example of a duality where the theory in the ultraviolet is free and the theory in the infrared is free, but it's a different theory. And um, there was some recent progress in this paper by Gaeto, Seibert, and Kormogodsky for recent insights, including connections to 3D quantum field theory dynamics and dualities on the domain walls. Uh, part of why I wanted to talk about this is that is just to illustrate that in general, we're unable to follow actually this renormalization group flow in detail. Like here, we're unable to follow it from the ultraviolet to the infrared of showing that there's confinement. This is one of the million dollar clay prizes to show that, and so no one's collected the million dollars yet. But nevertheless, um, it's often possible to use, uh, basically to guess the answer and to use symmetry constraints to check, uh, to do some non-trivial cross-checks and to gain some confidence if the answer is right. Okay, so there are various constraints on the renormalization group flows. One is that um, if the theory has uh, non-trivial Tooft anomalies, so I'll be discussing various examples with the Tooft anomalies and discuss more in, in detail what they are. Then um, there's a powerful constraint, which is that, is that they, have to mat they have to be constant on renormalization group flows. So this is the condition of a Tooft anomaly matching. Um, so that's one constraint. Another constraint is the intuition that renormalization group flows reduce the number of degrees of freedom. So um, when count of the degrees of freedom in two, four, and I believe also in six dimensions is the conformal anomaly A. So if we look at a conformal field theory, 
the trace of the stress tensor should be zero, but it's, if the theory is put on a curved background, it could be non-zero. And these coefficients are uh, the conformal anomalies. These were, these were first studied uh, by Duff. And he, he has a nice uh, review about these conformal anomalies where he talks about how he was a student of uh, Salam and some of the, the controversy originally surrounding these conformal anomalies. Uh, anyway, the conformal anomaly A is this coefficient of the Euler density. So this is something that you can build out of the curvature tensor in even space-time dimensions. And in odd dimensions, there's an analog of this using the sphere partition function and the entanglement entropy. And then there's additional power from supersymmetry uh, because, for instance, uh, oper operators have to form supermultiplets and the anomalies have to form supermultiplets. And this can relate, for instance, at hoofed anomalies to conformal anomalies. That's something that I'll discuss in six dimensions in the third lecture is the connection between at hoofed anomalies and the conformal anomaly. Okay, so um, I thought I would discuss a little bit first some of the unitarity bounds and, and the structure of conformal field theories. So the idea in a conformal field theory is that uh, we have a bigger symmetry than space-time, than the usual Lorentz symmetry. So if we're indeed in space-time dimensions, uh, if we think about the theory in Euclidean space, we could say that there's an SOD uh, symmetry, which is the Euclidean uh, rotations and Lorentz transformations. And then we can combine that with the um, translation symmetries and with you know, addition, with the dilatation symmetry and the special conformal symmetry to get a bigger symmetry group, which is SOD comma two. So in D space-time dimensions, there's an S, conformal field theories have a SOD comma two symmetry. And the operators form representations of this symmetry. And the way that the representations look is that there's some operator at the bottom of, of the multiplet, which, um, so here the raising operators are the momentum generators, which are like derivative operators. And then the lowering operators are the special conformal generators, k mu. And so this primary operator is annihilated by k mu at, at the origin. And then we form descendants by acting with p mu. And if the theory is unitary, um, there's a, a condition which is that, well, by, by using the operator state correspondence, we can form an inner product of these. So the inner product is basically related to the two-point function of two operators. And that, if the theory is unitary, that uh, inner product has to be positive definite. So the norm of the operator has to be positive, and it can only be zero if the operator is zero. And so then we can impose that condition not just on the operator, but on its various descendants. So like the P mu acting on the operator has to satisfy this condition that it's bigger than or equal to zero, and it's equal to zero if and only if this operator here is zero. And then using the algebra, this leads to unitarity con constraints. So here D is the dilatation operator, M mu nu is the rotations, and so you can relate you can put bounds on the dimensions of operators and related to their spin. And when these inequalities are saturated, then some operator is zero. And so those, those operators are referred to as short representations. So examples of that are conserved currents. If we have a conserved current operator, then some descendant is zero. And, and so that's an example of a short representation. And these representations are protected in various ways. Okay, so to, just to mention some of these unitarity bounds, for scalar operators in D space-time dimensions, this is the bound. So it has to be bigger than or equal to D minus two over two. And if this inequality is saturated, then the operator is a free operator. The scalar operator satisfies, it has a level two descendant, which is basically just like saying it satisfies a free field Klein-Gordon equation. And such operators, um, have, for, have to have, for instance, boring operator product expansions because it's a free field operator. Another example is if we look at an operator which has S Lorentz indices that are symmetrized and uh, traceless, then the dimension of that operator has to be bigger than or equal to D plus S minus two. 
And these are conserved currents. So for instance, if S is one, then um, this is just like a usual flavor current. So it's dimension, if, if we saturate this, its dimension is D minus one, and it satisfies a conservation law. If S is two, this is the energy momentum tensor. So the dimension is D, and it satisfies the conservation of energy momentum. For S bigger than two, um, such conserved operators are believed not to exist unless the theory is, is kind of a free theory. And so, so usually um, we only have these operators in, in the interesting theory for S equals one or, or two. Um, let's see, so just to, uh, just to write down in five dimensions what these inequalities look like. In five dimensions, the Lorentz group is SO5, or the, yeah, the Lorentz group is SO5, and I could write down representations of SO5 um, using this, this notation of uh, two quantum numbers, J, I'll call them J1 and J2. So like in four dimensions, we have two quantum numbers like J and J bar, and in five dimensions, because the, those are like the SU2 left and SU2 right quantum numbers, in five dimensions, we have quantum numbers, Lorentz quantum numbers J1 and J2, and um, so if an operator has, and, and J1 is, uh, just, just to give some examples, uh, if J1 is one, that's a spinner, and if J2 is one, that's a vector. Th those are the two main representations of, of SO5. So if we have a representation with J2 bigger than one and any J1, then the, then the unitarity bound is that its dimension has to be bounded by this thing. So it's a half J1 plus two J2 plus three. I put a little star by that three just to remind myself that, um, so this is if J2 is bigger than or equal to one. If J2 is zero, instead of three, it's two. And so there are various things like this where for small quantum numbers, some of these bounds are slightly different. But anyway, if we look at where this is saturated, uh, for instance, this is, this is saturated if, um, if this operator, which is a level one descendant, has zero norm. Okay, so, so just to give an example of this, a flavor current is in the vector representation. So the vector representation are, I write as zero four, or, or sorry, zero one, and its dimension is four. So that, that's a conserved flavor current. This is a conserved energy momentum tensor and we could check that, that these are the right quantum numbers of the divergence. And the supercurrent is in the representation one comma one. So it's like a spinner, it has a spinner index and a vector index. And its dimension is four and a half. So that's what we get from this. Uh, this, is, this is another short multiplet. Well, so, so this is another bound that if the quantum number J2 is, is zero and uh, and if we have general J1, then, well, for instance, for J1 equals one, then the inequality is that the dimension has to be bigger than or equal to two, and this is saturated for a free fermion. Okay, in um, six dimensions, I thought I would also just briefly mention some of the unitarity bounds and, and the group theory. So in six dimensions, we can write if we go to Euclidean space, the Lorentz group is SO6, which we can think of as SU4. And so, um, so since SU4 has rank three, we need three labels. So J1, J2, and J3 are the, the three labels for representations. So we can write operators and their Lorentz quantum numbers is with these labels, J1, J2, and J3. And then this delta is the dimension of the operator. And so um, if, if J1 is anything and J2 is bigger than one and J3 is anything, then this, this is the bound on the dimension. And this is saturated for conserved currents. So examples are, for instance, uh, a conserved vector current, J mu, has these quantum numbers. Um, if you think about the Young tableaus, J1 is, is the number of columns with just one box, J2 is the number of columns with two boxes, and J3 is the number of 
columns with three boxes. So, um, so, so for instance, the vector if we, as a representation of SU4 is that representation, and so that's uh, 0, 1, 0. It has two boxes. And according to this inequality, it has dimension five, which is the right, when it's saturated, which is the right dimension for a conserved current. Uh, sorry, the stress tensor, uh, stress energy tensor is in this representation. So it has um, two columns with two boxes. And um, so this is J2 is two, and its dimension according to this inequality is six. And the conserved supercurrents um, are in this representation. It has one spinner index and one vector index, and its dimension is five and a half. And uh, so when its dimension is five and a half, it's conserved. Okay. Um, another example is if we take this J2 quantum number to be zero, and J1 and, and J3 to be non-zero, then we, this is the inequality for unitarity. And an example of where that's saturated is if we look at a representation where J1 is, is one and J3 is one. So that's something with, with three and one boxes. And that's the adjoint of SU4, which, which um, we, could, we could think about if we write these as here mu and nu are SO6 Lorentz indices. It's a two index anti-symmetric quantity. And so this is like a um, two form. This is a conserved two form. So if, if we take these quantum numbers and if the dimension is four, it satisfies this conservation law. And if, if we have such an operator, then we have a generalized global symmetry with a two-form current. Ah, um, yeah, yeah, so, so this is, yeah, Th this is, uh, Right, so the question is where, where do these, these things come from? Um, yeah, ba basically one has to just work out the, the commutator in, with the algebra to see where this thing comes from. So it's a bit of a long story. Yeah, yeah to, actually, to actually show where these offsets come from, it's a bit of a long story to, to work through the commutator. And um, yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe just take my word for it, and then I can, I can point out some references that, that work through it. Uh huh. Um, well, there, there are definitely, from the representation point of view, no. Yeah, so from the representation point of view, this, this is fine. I mean, definitely studying the theory, kind of the, the properties of correlation functions in Euclidean versus Lorentzian is, can be quite different. But in terms of just the counting of the operators in this representation theory, this, this works. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sir? Yeah, yeah, so, so the question was about which have protected dimensions. So anytime this, this inequality is, is saturated, this, this is like a short operator, and so that's a protected operator. And so, so for instance, um, the statement that conserved currents can't have anomalous dimension is because it's in this short representation. And so if we have some kinds of continuous parameters that we can dial, yeah, thank you for the, the question. I, wanted, I should have emphasized that more. Whenever these inequalities are saturated, one of the interesting things about them is, is that these are um, operators that if you, as you vary kind of continuous things like coupling constants 
or moving on spaces of vacuo and things like that, um, these are protected operators. The only way that they can become non-protected is if sometimes um, there can be some recombination rule where like, like for instance, if we have a conserved current that ends up being not conserved, like if we turn on some operator that violates some symmetry, then what happens is that in that case, the conserved current can get an anomalous dimension. And the way that, it, that that can happen is by pairing up with another operator. So sometimes we can have a situation where two short operators can form together to form a long operator. Like a conserved current plus a scalar operator can become a non-conserved current. But um, by themselves, all of these operators are, are protected operators. And if there's nothing that they can pair up with, sometimes you can argue that they have to remain conserved always. Thanks. Yeah, I just, I realized that I was talking probably too fast, and so I should, I should remember to ask people if there are other questions also. Questions? Yeah, okay. Um, so just, just to give a few other examples of six-dimensional uh, operators where, where we saturate these inequalities. Um, if, if we have any J1 and if J2 and J3 are, are zero, so this is like a, a representation of, a, of SU4 like that, then this is the inequality that we get. And, and these inequalities, when they're saturated, the, the fields are free fields. So the simplest example of that is if this J1 is one, this is a, a free fermion. So a six-dimensional fermion is in the four-dimensional representation of the Lorentz group. The Lorentz group is, is SU4. It's in the, it could be either in the four or the four bar. So this is the four, this is the four bar. And when this inequality is saturated, its dimension is two and a half, which is the right dimension for a free fermion. If we, if we write down like psi bar d slash psi in, in six dimensions, this thing will have dimension six if, if psi has dimension two and a half. Okay, and um, another example of an operator of this type is to, to take Instead of uh, being the firm, instead of the fermion where this is one, we can take something which is like a something that has two spinner indices. So we can take two indices here. So if, if we just have two boxes, and that's something which we could also write. So these are two symmetrized SU4 fundamental indices, and we could also write that as two anti-symmetrized Lorentz indices. This is just like in four dimensions where we can write f mu nu, for instance, as, as like a bispinner. And so in general, we can write down like a commutator of, of um, gamma matrices to get something which is, goes between b being a bispinner and being a two-form. So this is a two-form operator. And just like this one is a two-form operator, but this is a two-form operator that we get from one chiral and one anti-chiral spinner index. This is a two-form where both of them are chiral. So this is a non-chiral two-form and this is a chiral two-form. And this, this, this is a chiral boson. And the way that its chirality shows up is that if you write down the, the if we take D of this two-form, so we form a three-form by taking DX, then that three-form has to be either self-dual or anti-self-dual. So if it's this one, it's self-dual. If it's this one, it's anti-self-dual. And th these operators play a big role in the six-dimensional theories. That's part of why I wanted also to kind of go through this group theory was to, to introduce some of the things that will come up later. These uh, chiral two-form operators play a big role in six-dimensional uh, superconformal theories. And we can see from here that they have to have dimension three if they, are, if they saturate this inequality. So if, um, if J3, uh, so if, if either J1 is two or J3 is two, we get three here. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's a typo. Yeah, that should be zero, zero, two. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, 
So um, when we get to, to superconformal field theories, the algebra is, is uh, some super algebra version that should, that should contain also SO D comma two. So if we want to have a, a superconformal theory, the algebra should have SO D comma two plus some supercharges, and the supercharges have to be in the spinner representation of SOD comma two. And that turns out to be something that's not possible to do in general. The super algebras were classified by cats, and if you just look at these different super algebras and look for the condition of having a SOD comma two subgroup and having uh, fermionic operators that are in the spinner representation, in general, it's, it's not possible. It's only possible uh, in six dimensions and less. So there can be no superconformal field theories above six dimensions just because the algebra doesn't, doesn't exist. And in cases where it does exist, it always uses special properties of spinner representations. Uh, like for instance, in six dimensions, it exists thanks to the fact that, um, so the, the bosonic piece again includes this SO D comma two, which is like SO six comma two. And so this is, if we think about it in a Euclidean version, this is like SO8. And SO8 has triality between the spinner, the vector, and the other spinner representation. And the only reason why this superalgebra exists is thanks to the triality, because instead of thinking about it as a spinner, we could think about it as a vector. And so, so in six dimensions, this is the name of the supergroup. It's the OSP 6 comma 2 N. The algebra exists for any N. And it contains the conformal group, and then it contains this R symmetry, which is S P N R. And so this contain this is written as N comma zero supersymmetry. The supersymmetry in this case has to be chiral. So superconformal symmetries in, in six dimensions only exist for with chiral supersymmetry. All of the supercharges have to have the same chirality. And so there are um, eight N supercharges where, so, so the minimal supersymmetry would be eight supercharges, that would be one zero. Okay, in, in five dimensions, the supergroup is kind of a uh, supergroup version of F4. It's an exceptional group. And so it only exists for one, um, it only exists for like N equals one supersymmetry. So it contains as a subgroup this um, conformal group SO5 comma 2 it, and its R symmetry is SP1 which is, is the same as SU2. So there's an SU2 R symmetry and there are eight supercharges. And there's no, unlike six dimensions where it could exist for any N, here it only exists for N equals one. And then in, in four dimensions uh, it can be written down for any N. In three dimensions it could be written down for any N and also in two dimensions. Okay, when we look at the unitarity, unitarity conditions in superconformal field theories, um, in addition to requiring that, so we have this inner product just like in the non-supersymmetric case, so there's a positive definite inner product, and all of the descendants have to have non-negative norm, but now we can form descendants with both the momentum and also with the supercharges. So here we can form descendants with both. And so if we look at the representation, there's a superconformal primary at the bottom, which is annihilated. So basically what happens is just like P mu can be written as the anti-commutator of Q's, uh, K mu, which is the special conformal symmetry in general, can be written as the anti-commutator of some, some operators called S. So P mu raises the dimension by by one, K mu lowers it by one, and Q raises the dimension by a half, and S lowers it by a half. So there's an operator at the bottom which has the smallest dimension, and that's annihilated by the Q, by the S's rather. So S annihilates this operator at the bottom, and then we could fill out the multiplet of operators by acting with Q's. And so this is the conformal analog, the conformal field theory analog of, a, of like a super field. There's some operator in the superfield, and then we form the other operators by acting with the Qs. So here there's the super primary at the bottom, and then we form all of the other ones by acting with the Qs. 
And um, if we look modulo conformal descendants, so the Q's anti-commute up to, to P mu. So if we look modulo conformal descendants, we could think about the Q's as basically like anti-commuting with each other. And so this is a Grassmann algebra. And so if we look at what are these operators, what do they look like? In general, we could act with an anti-symmetric product of Q's up to L times, where L has to be at most, by Fermi statistics, at most the number of supercharges. And so if all of these operators are non-zero, then the multiplet is called long. So if the, this L max is the number of supercharges, then it's referred to as a long multiplet. And if the number, maximum number that we can get to here is something less than that, it's called a short multiplet. So for instance, half BPS operators satisfy that the condition that this LQ is half the number of supercharges. So, um, and if, if an operator is short, then that means that if we act with one more supercharge on that, on that operator, we get an operator which is zero. So at the top of, of the multiplet, we get something where if we act with another Q, we get zero. And that means that there's some null operator. Okay, so if, if we look at the form of these unitarity constraints, what it looks like in general is, is like this. So there's some dimen the, the dimension is bounded by some lower value and um, operators above this are called long operators. And then the short operators with the largest dimension are called A-type short operators. And these are right at the, the threshold of unitarity. And so these are operators where they could, for instance, get an anomalous dimension and pair up with some other operator and become a long operator. Then, it, then there's a gap where no operators can exist, and then there can be some new short operators which, that are called, for instance, B multiplets. And then there could be another gap, and then there could be more uh, short operators that could, let's call them C, with some speci specific dimension, delta C. Um, in five dimensions, we have short multiplets of this type, A, B, and C, and in six dimensions, we have short multiplets, one more, which is called D. So the difference between these is that if we look at the unitarity bounds, um, there's some function of the Lorentz quantum numbers, then there's something that depends on the R symmetry quantum numbers, and then there are these shifts, like this three and four that we saw also in the, in the Bosana case. And these shifts depend on whether it's this A, B, C, or D multiplet. So for instance, in 6D10, um, this is the dependence on the Lorentz quantum numbers. This is the dependence on the R symmetry quantum numbers. So for 1, 0, the R symmetry is an SU2 R symmetry. And this R is just the number of boxes, if we think about it, is a SU2 Young tableau. So the dimensions of the operators are bounded by this thing that depends on the Lorentz quantum numbers this thing that's the R symmetry, and then there are these shifts, which for the A multiplet, it's six. For the B multiplets, it's four. C, it's two, and D, it's zero. So the interest, one interesting thing about these shifts is, for instance, like this six here uh, means that the, the smallest dimension of an A multiplet, even if all of these quantum numbers are zero, would be six. And six is already like the dimension of the operator for being marginal in six dimensions. And so we can have a, an A multiplet whose bottom operator is marginal. But actually, if we want to have something that's supersymmetric, this, the supersymmetric operators are at the top of the multiplet because those are the operators that we can't act with any more Qs. If we act with any more Qs, we'll get something that's um, zero up to total derivatives. That's the condition that supersymmetry is preserved. And so what we see is that, for instance, the, in A multiplet, even the bottom is, is just marginal. And by the time we get to the top, it'll be irrelevant. And so what, what we can show from these shifts is that um, actually no supersymmetry preserving operators are relevant in a 1, 0 super conformal field theory. Every operator is irrelevant. Okay. Anyway, um, these short operators also play a, a big role in superconformal indices, which count these different short representations. 
Okay, so, so that's all I wanted to say with the slides, and then I'll transition, switch over to the chalkboard. Maybe, are, are there any questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's okay. The um, yeah. So the, the condition that we preserve supersymmetry is is that um, like we want the supercharge acting on like so. If we have some deformation, then then the supercharge acting on this deformation should be zero up to total derivatives. So it could be like p mu of something. And then, and then we'll still have um, the supersymmetry algebra being preserved. The, um, these S operators don't satisfy this condition, and and that's fine. That's that it still preserves supersymmetry. What that means is that it, it breaks the superconformal symmetries, which um, when we turn on these operators in general, we break conformal symmetry, and so we break the the extra the extra supersymmetries. Yeah, the S's the S's are 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 the aren't like the Q bars. There there's some extra uh, supersymmetry generators that that are special to the fact that it's superconformal. So yeah, so in the theory that's superconformal, you get an extra you kind of double the number of supercharges. But really, it's better to think about them as like raising and lowering. So just like um, you have this P mu which is the raising operator and then the special conformal operator that's k mu. And so like for instance, if, if we want, um, yeah, so, so, so in general like for instance, um, we can get something that's Lorentz invariant by writing down something that's an integral of some local thing and then we, we preserve this thing. But we don't preserve in general these k mu's because we break, we break conformal symmetry. Question? Uh huh? Yeah, in, gener in general, there, there are many different unitary representations, and so. There, there are many, in general, there are many ways to deform the, for instance, a supersymmetric theory by adding irrelevant operators, for instance. And, um, yeah, so, uh, like, like, for instance, in, in 4D n equals 1, you know that we can write down something which in superspace we'll, we usually write it as like d4 theta times k. And so, so this is, this is a kind of deformation that we would call a D term. Or, or we can write an integral over half of the superspace. And so, so we could think about this, the way that I'll think about this uh, in terms of this description is that this is of the form like Q to the fourth. acting on a long operator. And so if we act with, with all of the supercharges on a long operator, then we get something that's supersymmetric, and that's, that's a, a D term. And then this would be acting with Q squared on some short operator. And, and in this case, Q squared acting on the short operator is also the top of the multiplet. And so if we act with any more supercharges, um, We'll, we'll get zero, and so so these are examples of supersymmetry preserving deformations, and in, in general we'll have some very we'll have lots of operators, and we can look at this for any of these operators. 
I, I'm not sure if that was that the question. Yeah, if, if we want to preserve supersymmetry, then this is how we could deform the theory. We could deform the Lagrangian like delta L or deformations. That, that preserve supersymmetry. Uh, if they preserve supersymmetry if they're at the top of the multiplet. So in this case, what we would do is we would say that there's an operator O short at the bottom. And then we, we can act with So we can act with, with uh, like Q and Q to get two more operators. And then when we act with Q squared, we get to the operator here, which is at the top. And the, so here, we're increasing the dimension as we move up. And so, so this is, and this is this Q squared. So this, this would be an example of like an F term deformation. Okay. Um, uh, in supergravity? Yeah, we could, we, could, uh, we could do something also including like the graviton multiplet and, and all of this, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, part of what I'm saying is just the structure of, of supersymmetry, really. But um, at various places, I'll be discussing also like conformal symmetry. But yeah, yeah, basically, this is also we could apply this also in supergravity. Okay. Um, yeah. So if we look at the different supermultiplets, we could ask what are the supermultiplets of the conserved currents. And so, so one example of a conserved current multiplet is a flavor current. So we have J, some current, let's say J mu, whose dimension is d minus one, so that if we integrate this over uh, space, we'll get some dimensionless charge. And this thing respects supersymmetry let, let's say that it uh, should commute modulo something that's like p mu, the total derivatives, uh, in order to satisfy the algebra, because we want the, the charge associated with this current. This is the supercharge. We want the, the algebra should be that the supercharge commutes with this J mu, unless it's an R symmetry current. So the case where this doesn't happen is for an R symmetry current. So for an R symmetry current, Q is charged. And so then in that case, this thing is non-zero, but it's something that measures the charge of, of Q under that R symmetry. So these, these are two kinds of symmetries that we'll often talk about are flavor symmetries or R symmetries. And um, in, in the case of the, the flavor current, this condition that Q annihilates it up, up to total derivatives means that this J mu at, has to be at the top of the multiplet. So anything that's a flavor current has to be at the top of its multiplet. Whereas um, this, for our symmetries, the condition that Q is charged means that um, J mu, if it's in our symmetry, is one 
below the supercurrent. So the, the supercurrent is the operator whose charge is J mu. And um, so, so basically the structure in, in this case is that we have J mu r if we act with this supercharge. Let's put here alpha for some spinner index. So if, if we look in the multiplet, what it looks like is that we have the R symmetry current, we have um, this supercurrent, let's call it Q mu, mu alpha. So, so this is the thing where if we integrate, um, so here Q alpha, is the integral over space. the time component. So, so this is the, the density associated with the supercharge. And then if we act with one more Q alpha, um, we have to get the stress energy tensor. So, so this is in order for, to have the right commutation relations where two Qs anti-commute to be P mu. Um, so the condition that Q, Q anti-commutes to P mu tells us that Q, the anti-commutator of Q with this Q um, beta mu is the energy momentum tensor. I guess there's some twos. So, um, and then the energy momentum tensor has to be the top of its multiplet. If we act with any more supercharges on this, because this is already an anti-commutator of two Qs, or because this is already an anti-commutator with Q, we'll see that if we act with another supercharge, we have to get zero up to total derivatives. So this thing also has to be the top of the multiplet. So the this, this stress tensor is at the top of its multiplet and flavor currents are at the top of their multiplet. And actually this condition that these things are at the top of the multiplet tells, you, tells us that they can only exist if there aren't too many supersymmetries. Like this condition that, that this J mu is at the top of the supermultiplet, this implies that the number of supercharges has to be at most eight in order to have a, a conserved flavor current. So theories with more than eight supercharges, um, if we just look at the condition to have the, the current be at the top of the multiplet, it's just not possible with more than eight supercharges. Oh, sorry? Uh -huh. Yes, yes, yeah, for any dimension. That, that we have to have at most eight supercharges? Um, yeah, so if you, if you just look at the representations, um, yeah, be, it, it's a little bit of work to, to show where this thing, where this condition comes from. But if we just look at this condition that, um, that we should have a operator which is like a Lorentz vector at the top of the multiplet with, and, and by the way, since it's a conserved current, its dimension has to have this special value. What, what you see is that these conditions um, are just not compatible with the representation theory if the number of super, in any dimension, if the number of supercharges is, is bigger than eight. So like, like an, example of, an example of this is if we look at 4D, N equals two. This has eight supercharges. Um, and there we can have flavor currents. Whereas if we look at 4D, N equals four, then we have 16 supercharges and there we can't have flavor currents. 
Also in 4D, there's N equals three supersymmetry, which also doesn't admit flavor occurrence. Yeah, so, so it just comes from, it's a little bit of work to show where it comes from, but this condition that's at the top of the multiplet is very restrictive. And likewise, this condition that the stress tensor is at the top of its multiplet is very restrictive. And actually this condition, this, this condition implies that um, if D is bigger than three, the number of supercharges can be at most 16 in order to have the stress tensor be at the top of its multiplet. So like for instance, in, in six dimensions, in six dimensions, we can have one zero supersymmetry, which has eight supercharges, or we can have two zero, which has 16 supercharges, and we can write down an algebra with three zero symmetry, so this would have 24 supercharges, but, but this one and, and higher ones aren't allowed because even though the, the super, super conformal algebra exists, it's impossible to write down uh, these charges <clears throat> as being integrals of local currents in that case because you don't get a stress tensor which is at the top of the multiplet. So, so this thing is not possible because the T mu nu is not at the, at the top. Here I put, uh, if the, the, this thing about the dimension having to be bigger than three, D equals three is an exception. In D equals three, we can have any NQ is possible. But um, and if NQ is bigger than 16, it's a necessarily a free theory. So we can write down a free field theory with arbitrary numbers of supersymmetries in three dimensions, but we can't write down an interacting version. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah, so the, so the condition that the T mu nu is at the top of the multiplet is because um, it, it follows from this condition that if we look at a commutator of Q alpha with T mu nu, we get zero mod P mu. Like if, if we just look at the algebra uh, and we use something which is like a Jacobi identity, we can see that this Q has to commute with T mu nu modulo P mu just, just to have the right algebra. And so this is, this is exactly the condition that it's at the top of the multiplet. Like Q, Q acts with these commutators or anti-commutators and zero mod P mu means that it's at the top of its multiplet. That's right, that's right, yeah. So we can write down a three comma zero algebra, but it's, it doesn't have, a, it can't have a possibly a stress tensor with the right properties. So that, so that rules out like three zero supersymmetry. So, so the biggest supersymmetry, um, yeah, so like in fact in the next lecture I'll be focusing on this two zero theory in six dimensions, which is the most number of supersymmetries in the highest dimension. And so this, this kind of thing about the group, just the group theory tells us that even though the charge algebra would exist for three zero, there's no way to write it down in terms of a local stress energy tensor that integrates to give those charges. Yeah, so there, there's, uh, I guess there are other things we, one could say about the group theory, but I think, I think, um, yeah, I think in the next lecture I'll I'll kind of just skip ahead to properties of like the two zero theory. <laughs>